Hi everyone, I'm Emma Eggleston, Dean of the WVU School of Medicine Eastern Campus. Welcome to tonight's Mini Med School. Tonight's topic is on your hearing health care in the times of COVID-19. We're very fortunate to have two of our audiology faculty, Dr. Lindsay Bruce and Dr. Betsy Sears, here to guide us through advances in the diagnosis and treatment of hearing loss, the impacts of COVID-19, and some patient-centered approaches we can take to hearing healthcare. So doctors Bruce and Sears do an outstanding job of taking care of the hearing health of our community. And we're really looking forward to learning more from their expertise and experience. Thank you for joining us this evening for our presentation on understanding your hearing health care and the challenges within the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Dr. Betsy Sears, and I'm an audiologist with WVU Medicine Ear, Nose, and Throat. My colleague, Dr. Lindsay Bruce, will also be joining us later to discuss the challenges within our field. May is Better Hearing and Speech Month, and we wanted to take this opportunity to bring awareness to the importance of your hearing health care. The mission behind Hearing and Speech Month is making effective communication a human right, accessible, and achievable for all, despite any barriers. As audiologists, we serve through excellence in patient care, research, and education. The World Health Organization released a world report on hearing in early 2021 and noted more than 1.5 billion people worldwide have hearing loss, with 430 million of which require rehabilitation services. As we look at future trends of hearing loss, research suggests more people over time will have hearing loss and require rehabilitation services. Trends suggest by 2050, we could see nearly 2.5 billion people worldwide with some degree of hearing loss and 700 million of them needing some form of assistance. In order to understand in hearing health care, we must first understand the process of hearing. The outer ear or the pinna collects a sound and transmits it towards the middle ear. This information is sent by vibrating the eardrum and transferring to the three tiny bones of the middle ear called the ossicles. The sound is then sent to the cochlea or the organ of hearing where there are thousands of small hair cells that send impulses through to the auditory nerve to the brain where the information is produced into meaningful sounds. If there is an obstruction or damage to any of these parts, the, the hearing loss can occur. There are many different causes of hearing loss which can affect the outer, middle, and inner ear. The outer ear can be affected due to cerumen or wax buildup, infections, perforations, or deformities. The, inner, the middle ear can be affected due to infections, fluid, otosclerosis, or cholesteatomas. And then the inner ear can be affected due to aging, noise exposure, ototoxic medication, and even trauma. There are many signs of hearing loss. Some we'll cover here today. One in particular is people may feel that the clarity of speech or speech may not be as clear as maybe it once was. They may find the difficulty hearing in background noise environments. Others around them may find that they turn the volume up on the television and then decreased ability in hearing high pitched sounds such as birds chirping, bells, children, or women. They also may find that others around them are mumbling or speaking with their words running together. And then one very important factor that people say all the time is that they can hear, but maybe not understand. The reason why these hearing loss have difficulty with understanding others is because speech understanding requires hearing the soft, high-pitched sounds of speech. Effective and timely interventions can benefit all those at risk or living with hearing loss. Hearing loss can be addressed through screening for early intervention for hearing loss across the lifespan. 
For children, it's very important to consider improved maternal and neonatal care, newborn and well child hearing screenings, immunizations for viruses associated with hearing loss, and screening for and early management of otitis media. In adults, it's important to consider noise control and safe listening levels, surveillance of ototoxic medications, and also wellness hearing screenings as we age. In fact, the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association recommends hearing evaluations every decade until the age of 50 and at least every three year intervals after that. Noise-induced hearing loss can occur with a one-time exposure or over an extended period of time. This is caused by hearing loss as a result of damage to structure and or, or nerve fibers of the inner ear. The hearing loss from noise exposure can occur in both children and adults. In fact, research has shown that as many as 5.2 million children and 40 million adults have some form of hearing loss caused by noise exposure. Of these adults, one in two in the U.S. have noise-induced hearing loss from recreational noise, and one in four adults in the U.S. report good or excellent hearing actually have some degree of hearing loss. Hearing loss caused by noise exposure, exposure is preventable. There are many ways to prevent noise-induced hearing loss, and some of the signs that the environment may be too noisy can include maybe speaking up or moving too close to the individual when he, trying to hear them, ear pain following exposure, others commenting that you're talking too loudly, tinnitus, which we'll discuss here momentarily, and muffled hearing. Some ways to protect your hearing in these environments are to avoid or limit exposure to excessive noise, turn down the volume of music systems, create distance between you and the sound source, Use adequate hearing protection, such as NRR of 20 or more, and also check your listening environments. Many smartphones nowadays have smart, uh, free apps that you can use to download in those environments. As someone wants to manage his or her hearing loss, they should fo follow a patient-centered approach. Medical and surgical management of ear diseases can potentially minimize or reverse this associated hearing loss. Significant progress has been made over the years with regards to hearing technology so that there's a range of effective options available to address the needs and preferences of people with hearing loss. Options may include hearing aids, cochlear implants, or bone anchored hearing aids. It may also include access to sign language or assistive technology like captioning services. However, it is essential that the use of hearing technology is accompanied with support services and rehabilitation therapy to ensure desired outcomes. There has been a lot of research on the impact of untreated hearing loss. One very important consideration is the possible impact of cognitive decline. Research has shown a strong association between hearing loss and the risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. Those with hearing loss have an increased risk for accelerated decline in cognitive function over time. A study published in Neuropsychology found that those living with untreated hearing loss experience an accelerated rate of cognitive decline by as much as 30 to 40 percent compared to their peers with normal hearing. Another factor to consider is the effect on well-being or mental health. We've seen firsthand in our clinics and within the research the impact of what untreated hearing loss can have on overall well-being. Sometimes it is easier for a person with hearing loss to choose to be withdrawn from conversation than to struggle his or her way through understanding others. Those with hearing loss can have more limited social networks and interactions with others leading them to be withdrawn, isolated, and even lonely. There is a higher estimated prevalence of depression and depressive symptoms among adults with hearing loss. 
Additionally, auditory deprivation can also occur when untreated hearing loss can lead to the inability to process information due to the lack of auditory input. Even a mild hearing loss can lead to structural brain integrity changes that can change speech comprehension ability. The effect of untreated hearing loss can also impact the pediatric population, particularly with their development of speech and language ability. Children with hearing loss on average show depressed language levels compared to normal hearing peers. However, studies show risk for falling behind in speech and language are moderated by early and consistent access to well-fit hearing aids and early intervention services. A study published in The Lancet identified hearing loss as one of the 12 modifiable risk factors for cognitive decline. They touched on the importance of prevention and management of hearing loss, such as protecting your hearing from excessive noise exposure and using hearing aids when needed. The seminars and hearing studies showed treated hearing loss from hearing aids improved quality of life, increased ability to talk or engage in conversation, and improved ability to communicate effectively. This can have an overall positive impact on one's mental health and well-being. Lastly, I wanted to briefly discuss a common symptom that can be associated with hearing loss. Tinnitus is noticed as a perception in the head or ears when no other sound source is present. The current research suggests that 2.6 billion people worldwide or over 50 million Americans have some form of this perception. The perception can be reported as many different sounds such as a ringing, buzzing, hissing, chirping, humming, static, or even crickets. Many different factors that can cause tinnitus are noise exposure, head or neck trauma, disorders such as Lyme's disease, tumors, wax buildup, TMJ, cardiovascular disease, or even certain medications. Some contributing factors that can exacerbate the tinnitus are stress, anxiety, fatigue, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, or sodium. It's important to talk to your primary care physician or see an audiologist to have your hearing, hearing evaluated. Remember, the main thing is that there is help available. I would like to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Bruce at this time to discuss current challenges in our field of audiology. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Lindsay Bruce, one of the audiologists at WV Medicine Ear, Nose, and Throat. I just wanted to spend some time this evening with you guys talking about some emerging ear health concerns and how it relates to COVID and the pandemic. For example, increased pre-existing tinnitus or new onset tinnitus. Um, as audiologists, we want to understand how the virus and the pandemic itself play a role in someone's ear health. Regarding tinnitus, as Dr. Sears had mentioned, this is a complex symptom that can be exacerbated or um, caused by internal and external factors. You know, someone experiencing this symptom because they have increased stress, feelings of loneliness, anxiety, um, is there changes in their overall health as they're recovering from the virus? Um, medications such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have been used in the management of the virus. And we know that these have ototoxic properties that can um, cause hearing loss, tinnitus, and vestibular symptoms. So there's a need for high quality research to determine if there's a clear connection between ear related symptoms and the virus and medical management of the virus. Um, but what we can do right now as healthcare providers is ask our patients about changes in their ear health and refer for audiological management and monitoring as needed. Another challenge we're seeing in our clinical practice and in research is disruptions in communication as it relates to mask wearing and social distancing. So the widespread use of these things during the pandemic has created some communication challenges, particularly those with hearing loss. Uh, we know that masks attenuate important speech frequencies. Um, a study by Golden and colleagues in 2020 shed some light on how much overall loudness we lose by wearing a mask. And how much loudness we lose is dependent upon the type of mask somebody is wearing. 
So a simple surgical mask, we can see overall loudness reduced by 3 to 4 dB, N95s by 9 to 12 dB. The use of transparent masks have become increasingly popular, especially with communicating with people with hearing loss. Um, even those with normal hearing rely on visual cues and lip reading to some degree. So while transparent masks preserve visual cues, which we know is important for verbal and nonverbal communication, they reduce overall loudness by 21 dB. Then we think about masks and wearing face shields, and we can see overall loudness go, by, go down by up to 30 dB. So this is gonna have a significant impact on the way that we understand others. Um, another factor that we keep in mind is um, social distancing. So the inverse square law tells us as we double the distance from the sound source, we reduce overall loudness by half. Um, so thinking about speech sounds for somebody with hearing loss, six feet with a mask may sound like 12 feet without a mask. Um, this is gonna give some significant difficulties for someone with hearing loss listening, listening to somebody who is mask wearing and socially distanced. Um, we have to be aware of those communication barriers. The pandemic has disrupted the delivery of healthcare, especially at the onset, um, but we are fortunate to have access to telemedicine. This allows the patient to not delay their care, allows the patient and the provider to be seen and heard while both parties remain protected. Outside of telemedicine, there are speech to text apps available on your mobile phone and your desktop computer, often for free or little cost. Um, that display the communication across the screen. Captioning services such as um, landline caption telephones and captioning on televisions help a patient with hearing loss understand better. So I think we just have to continue to be creative and evolve the way that we communicate during this time. Um, another challenge that we are seeing come up during this time is how patients are navigating how they're going to manage their hearing loss. As patients are becoming more of, um, aware of their hearing loss, I think they're also becoming more aware of what's available to them right at home to manage their communication needs. They're searching the internet and looking at what's being advertised that can be um, given directly to them without having to leave their house. So we just want to spend a little bit of time with you this evening talking about the differences between hearing aids and over-the-counter devices such as personal sound amplifiers and over-the-counter hearing aids. So a hearing aid is a wearable medical device that's regulated by the FDA. It's intended to compensate for hearing impairment. So there's guidelines set in place to make sure that that hearing aid is safe for you and is dispensed to you in an ethical manner. A personal sound amplifier is also a wearable device, but it's considered non-medical. It's not regulated by the FDA, and it's designed to accentuate certain listening environments for those with normal hearing. So that might be like bird watching, hunting, um, or listening to soft sounds that might otherwise be difficult for somebody who has no hearing impairment. The other um, issue that we're navigating right now is over-the-counter hearing aids. And so in 2017, Congress passed the Over-the-Counter Hearing Aid Act. The purpose of this act was to provide some regulations for over-the-counter hearing aids. The intention was to increase access to direct con consumer options for management for hearing loss. Um, it was designed for adults with perceived mild to moderate hearing impairment. Um, they were um, intended to be fundamentally the same as a hearing aid. They wanted FDA to establish some regulations within three years of passing this act to provide some assurance to the public that whatever they're seeing um, as a direct consumer option was um, safe and effective for them, would have some limits on how loud that device could get, clear labeling when it would be contraindicated to use that device um, and when they should really consult a physician, and some guidelines set forth on how that product would be sold to the consumer. But unfortunately, the FDA has been unable to establish these guidelines and they've been delayed by the pandemic. So that leaves you as the consumer navigating this market on your own, and we can't even identify how these products are working and what's gonna be appropriate for you. 
So one of our roles as an audiologist is to help patients navigate the current online presence for direct to consumer management of hearing loss. There is significant differences between hearing aids and over-the-counter devices. Um, we can't compare the two, it's not apples to apples. Uh, like we said, over-the-counter hearing aids are fundamentally the same, which means they have the general same components as a hearing aid, but they're operating differently. The major, manu ma excuse me, the major manufacturers in the industry invest significant resources and time, often years, into the research and development of their technology. So prior to a hearing aid even hitting the market, being available to a patient, um, it will go undergo several in-house studies and clinical field trials to make sure that that hearing aid is going to perform the way it's intended to. That data of that research is readily available to the public and to hearing healthcare providers, um, whereas over-the-counter hearing aids are not developed in that same way. As a consumer, you should really question these online companies to give you the data to support the claims that they're making on how um, these products are developed and the research that goes behind it. The research efforts that are conducted by hearing aid manufacturers cost money and that will, take in, that will be taken into account um, of the underlying cost of the hearing aid. So when thinking about the two, hearing aids will likely cost more than um, an over-the-counter device. Hearing aids are restricted medical devices intended for the treatment of hearing loss. Over-the-counter hearing aids are not currently regulated or recognized by the FDA for management of hearing loss. So hearing aids must follow state and federal guidelines to ensure that that product is safe and it's given to you ethically. Um, when online companies advertise as FDA registered, sometimes that can be confusing or even often misleading um, that um, what you're seeing is gonna be good for you, for your hearing impairment and for your communication needs. But we have to remember FDA registered does not mean FDA approved or regulated. Any device that's intended for human use has to be FDA registered. The FDA even issued a statement in 2018 directed towards these online companies saying that no product that you have can claim that it addresses hearing loss or be called an over-the-counter hearing aid. Yet we see these products all over the internet, so it's difficult for a patient to understand what would be good for them. That selection process between a hearing aid and an over-the-counter device will look vastly different. Selection and management of a hearing aid is done by an expert in the field like an audiologist. We take into account the type and degree of hearing loss, your communication needs, um, your lifestyle. All of that information really drives the recommendations that are given to you so that you can make the decision on how you want to pursue the journey for your hearing health care. The selection of an over-the-counter device is left into the consumer's hands, and that's based on your own perceptions if you have mild to moderate hearing impairment. Um, in a, a study published in 2020 um, showed that self-reported hearing loss is not a reliable indicator of measured hearing loss. In this study of those with measured hearing loss, 49% of them with mild loss and 18% of them with moderate loss rated their hearing as excellent or good. And then 46% of them with severe hearing loss thought they had little to moderate trouble. So relying on hearing loss creates this, or relying on self-perceived hearing loss creates this unnecessary barrier between timely intervention um, and it also um, creates a barrier between significant degrees of hearing loss and medically treatable hearing loss getting the appropriate care that you need. We also believe this sheds some light on multidisciplinary care and the importance of that between specialties and family medicine and getting those timely hearing screens with your primary care provider and diagnostic testing with an audiologist. Um, by using age-appropriate specialized testing, hearing loss can be identified in patients across the lifespan. Some of the things that you can expect within our office when coming for an appointment with an audiologist is first we just want to get to know you. We take an in-depth case history. We want to know about you and your individual health, your family health history, and all of that information along with our diagnostic testing really paints a picture about your ear health. Some of the diagnostic tools that we use, um, otoscopy, we start off by just taking a look in your ear to see if there's any obstruction or immediate need for medical care. Um, then we can make that referral. 
We take a measurement of your eardrum and it also gives us some indication of middle ear status through a test called tympanometry. Audiometry measures the level at which you can hear soft sounds across a frequency range and this gives us type and degree of hearing loss. Speech testing is completed to help us understand how well your auditory system and auditory centers of the brain understand certain speech sounds and distinguish words. And this test can be done in noise and quiet. And all of this information helps us counsel you on what's gonna be next steps. Do we need to make a referral for medical management? Are hearing aids or other assistive communication devices gonna be what's next for you? Uh, we emphasize patient-centered care in our office. Uh, we believe that by you being knowledgeable of your hearing loss and how that may affect your communication ability and how that can impact your overall lifestyle and quality of life, we feel that you can take responsibility for your own hearing loss and advocate for your hearing health care needs. With the guidance of an audiologist and when necessary, an ear, nose, and throat provider like an otolaryngologist, we feel that a patient will be in the position to make a well-informed decision on how to manage your hearing healthcare journey. Thank you.